Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky is one of the most beloved spin-off games in any game series. And why wouldn't it be? It has some of the best cast members that the Pokemon series has ever seen. On top of that, it has an art style that everybody recognizes the moment it enters your field of view. And believe it or not, it has the best story out of any Pokemon game. So what would happen if you make a ROM hack that sets itself in the future of this timeline? Well guys, I introduce you to Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, the bright future. We get greeted by the Portal Master, which is the guy that sends you to the Pokemon world from the human world. But as it turns out, we've already been here before. So he asks me if we remember what Pokemon we are and we answer with Score Bunny. He then tells me to pick my partner, but he's having some trouble locating any partner options for me. But when he reaches out to one, there's no response, only a thick fog. After this, I normally have to give my partner a nickname, maybe this will make him show up. I named him Santa because I was recording this around the Christmas time period and it's only now coming out. Then finally somebody reaches back and it turns out to be a Rockruff who'll be our partner. Just before sending us off, the portal keeper says, now goes we go and fulfill your destiny once more. And that's when chapter one, a familiar future, starts as we get thrown into a weird world of Pokemon. I wake up shocked seeing that I've turned into a Pokemon once again and ask myself why I'm here once more. Unfortunately, I don't remember any details of the last time I I came here, and just when I'm thinking about my escape route, Rockruff comes along, who says that he's part of an exploration team and is here to save me. He's a member of Team Brawl and is ready to send me back to the guild with his badge. But he's incredibly impatient because we can't even get a word out and floop, we're already out of there. We end up in this familiar place called the Pokemon Guild. We overhear a couple of Pokemon talking about the Rockruff that just saved us, and this seems to be the rest of Team Brawl. They're saying that this Rockruff that they've just recruited is way too bad for their team and can't even handle an E-ranked mission. The team consists of Toxtricity, Scrafty and their leader, War Turtle. He apparently also stole a big apple from Kecleon's dungeon shop once and that got the entire team killed, so they kind of want to get rid of him. But War Turtle doesn't just want to turn her back on Rockruff and wants to give him one last chance. They run off and Rockruff teleports back in, saying that we don't have to give him a reward because he just likes helping out other Pokemon. We say thanks and he asks me where I'm heading because he hasn't seen my face around here yet. Reluctantly, we tell him that we're a human that turned into a Pokemon and this shocks the little pupper. He thinks that this is super cool, but he already knows about humans turning into Pokemon from an old tale that War Turtle used to tell him. He wants me to meet his team, but they've already gone back to their room and Rockruff doesn't actually live here himself. Whenever they need him, they just call him from the assembly, meaning that he's just the Pokemon that they picked up somewhere in a dungeon. And his dream is that they would just once take him in for guild dinner because he has heard that Rybomb B is the best cook around. He then offers me to give me a tour of Treasure Town so that we can get the know to place a little better. He explains how his team is actually silver rank and that they go on lots of missions together. On top of that, a lot of Pokemon have migrated here from other regions, which means there's a lot of new Pokemon compared to the actually mystery dungeon explorers of Sky. Then there is also the Wobbly Watmill, which is run by Alcrumi and is the one-stop shop for wary travelers. And since we have no place to sleep, Rockruff decides to pay for me so I can stay there a night. He heads back home and tells me he'll check up on me in the morning, but the only thing we can think about is the tale that he's heard about other humans. We have to ask around if other people know about humans and maybe then we can find a way back to our world. With these thoughts, we go to sleep and we wake up the next morning and we see Rockruff, who's gotten a task from his other team members to go to Pal Woods to complete a mission there. But in order to enter the Pal Woods, he needs another partner, so he asks if we want to be the leader today. Unfortunately, we first say no because we think it's going to distract us from our main issue, but he gets incredibly sad and then we think about how nice he's been to us and that maybe we need to go through some dungeons in order to get home, so we might as well train up a little bit. Our mission is to find a Pidgey and help it out. So just like in any other mystery dungeon game, we beat up some senseless Pokemon, climb up some stairs, and reach the Pal Woods clearing. We say that we're here to save the Pidgey, and he says that he lost his partner on an earlier floor, but before he can even finish his sentence, Rockruff already sends him back to the guild. The only thing we can think about is that we did this mission wrong, but Rockruff doesn't seem to notice and sends us back to Treasure Town. That's when War Turtle comes along and calls Rockruff over, so we go and eavesdrop on the conversation to see what they're saying. They're kicking it off the team for screwing up yet another mission because the Pidgey is here and he explained it all to the other team members. He will still be under the responsibility of Team Brawl because they don't want to abandon him but they won't be calling him up for jobs anymore. Rockruff tries to explain
complain and get out of it by saying it's not his fault, but he was just too impatient and War Turtle has enough of it. They tell him to hand in his badge because his qualities are just not enough for a silver exploration team. Rockruff then runs off screaming, you're not kicking me off, I quit! They part ways and we feel really bad for Rockruff, so we follow him because we might be able to cheer him up. He says that the sea is beautiful and that he didn't even know that there was such a thing as a sea or exploration team or even kindness because he was born in a dungeon where it's all survival of the fittest. Then one moment as he was defending his territory he fainted and when he woke up he saw three powerful Pokemon so he asked if he could join them on their trip through the dungeon and beyond. And that's how he ended up here and even though he got kicked off the exploration team he still thinks it's the best thing he's ever done. But the Rockruff's words jogged my memory as it turns out I was a guild member myself the last time I was here and so that leads me to the conclusion if I form a team with Rockruff that might take me a step closer to getting back home. So we ask him if he wants to form an exploration team together with me. He says that this is the best idea ever because now he can form another team with his cool new friend and we shouldn't waste any more time and get to it immediately. We have to head to guild Miss Wigglytuff so she can coronate us and then maybe he can also eat some of that famous Rybombi food he's heard so much about. And that's when chapter 2 the Futures Guild starts. We talk to Surfitched, who's Wigglytuff's assistant, and tell him we want to join up as a new exploration team. He says that they don't get a lot of new members because apprenticeship here is not for the faint of heart. Rockruff mentions that he was already a guild member here, and Surfitched asks for which team and his name. He answers with Team Brawl. Unfortunately, Surfitched says that he's still affiliated with them, which means he can't lead a team at this time. But that's no problem because it will be the team team leader here. We don't want an impatient Rockruff making all the decisions anyway. Surfitch takes us to Guild Miss Wigglytuff, who seems to be the great 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 granddaughter of Guildmaster Wigglytuff himself. She tells us to pick a team name because that's incredibly important. We decide to go with Team Smash because we're going to absolutely smash Team Brawl. This reminds Surfetch of his time in an exploration team and goes on a long monologue of his very first mission. But Rockruff doesn't care and says, uh, Surfetched, that was a great story, but can we have our bag and batch please? And even Wigglytuff has fallen asleep. But it doesn't matter because she still registers us as a new exploration team and asks us for our names. Once I tell her my name is Wiggo, she says that she's already met me before, but can't seem to remember from where. Surfetch starts thinking as well and his head starts to hurt incredibly when he tries to think of me, and so the mystery of my past continues. We get assigned to our room and Surfitch tells us a tale about how two of the most legendary explorers used to occupy this room years ago, so we have to treat it with as much care as we can. This does put a lot of pressure on us, but Rockruff is determined for me to get my memories back and also to try and get home once again. Until then, I'm Zwigo, Team Smash's leader. The next morning we wake up and hear cheers from outside the room, which means we're already late to our very first meeting. After all these years, the motto is still the same, and three smiles go for miles. And just when they're about to send the Pokemon off to their daily activities, we say, wait for us! Surfage tells us to not make this a habit, but still introduces us to the rest of the team members. Everybody seems pretty hyped that we're here because they haven't had new recruits in ages, and as Surfage sends everybody away, Furfru stays behind, saying that we need a glow-up and a makeover. So she gives Rockruff a defense scarf which will bring out out the fluffiness in his coat while boosting his defenses. And I get a red bow to highlight my fiery aura and slightly boost all of my stats. And if we ever want to switch it up, we have to come to her for all of our style and fashion problems. As it turns out, Togodomaru is in charge of updating that bulletin board, so we go and take a look if there is any jobs available for us. Then it cuts to a conversation between Team Brawl, and they seem to be incredibly jealous that we got the hero room, even though they're staying in the great Biberel room who was also one of the greatest explorers of all time. They still think we're going to absolutely crash down because we can't even wake up on time, but then War Turtle says that the team leader Zwigo seems a little bit odd, and when they start thinking of me, they all get incredible headaches, meaning that there's definitely something incredibly fishy going on, as it seems like everybody's memory of me was wiped. 
But we Team Smash started our adventures at the guild by taking easy jobs and sticking to low-level dungeons, until a few nights later, I started dreaming. Somebody's calling to me, saying, Hello, could it be you? Is your name Zwigo? But we can't answer, and they say, Guess not, you must just be an ordinary score bunny. And then they say, That's okay, sorry for barring you, go back to sleep. The only thing I can remember from this is that this voice is incredibly familiar, but I still can't remember where I know it from. We wake up the next morning and tell Rockruff about our strange dream, but he didn't seem to have any dreams last night, meaning that it was just us. We disregard it pretty quickly and move on to Chapter 3, The Tremor Troubles. On a different morning, we get woken up by some earthquakes, but we say that it's just nature and we go back to sleep. But then an even heavier earthquake happens a couple of minutes later, which shakes up the entire guild, so we go and check up on everybody to see if they're okay, but the entire guild is empty, so instead we go to Treasure Town where everybody's gathered. They're all complaining about how these earthquakes have caused them problems to surfage, so he tells them all to shut up because he knows how many of them have been busy preparing for the Daylight Festival and how these earthquakes can be a huge setback for that. So he offers a high reward to whichever of his apprentices will go to the Clay Flats in the south and find the source of these earthquakes and take it down. Almost all the teams are too scared to go there except for us and T brawl who interrupt us just before we say we're going to go. But they need to complete a job in the Thunder Tropics first, which they accepted already. We say that we have no jobs today, so we can leave immediately, and that's why Surfetch is giving this mission to us. So it's time for us to prove to everybody that we're not just a baby team, as we leave for the canyon immediately. Just in front of the canyon, Rockruff says that he wants to smash this problem up and show his former team members that he's strong. But who knows, that might not be the solution here. But we let it slide and enter the canyon together as we battle through waves of ground and rock-type Pokemon while a sandstorm is inflicting damage to us every other step. And so eventually we reach the Clay Flats depths, where we see two Mudbray testing out their magnitudes because they hit a 9 every time. They turn out to be brothers and are having a magnitude contest. They even say that someday their quakes will even make Zygarde proud. So without asking any questions, Rockruff goes in and pushes one of the Mudbray out of the way, making the other one even more mad. Rockruff says that they're just hurting the Pokemon in town and that we're here to stop them. But the Mudbray don't understand and say, we should teach him a lesson about messing with our family. Let's stomp him down, big brother. And so unfortunately, we have to fight these two horses. This was really easy because you're pretty overpowered here. You're a Scorbunny with Protein and Double Kick, which does insane damage. And when you return into the fighting type, their moves barely do anything against you. And once they're down and out, Rockruff says, are you going to stop attacking our town now? But the Mudbray don't understand what he's talking about and say that he started it. They even threaten to tell their parents who will then release a quake on us that will split the ground. Luckily, we are here to step in and say that this is all a big misunderstanding as we explain what their quakes have been doing to the town, but they had no idea they were causing this kind of ravage and havoc, so they apologize and promise to not do this again. But only if we promise to not tell their parents because then they'll get an ass whooping. With that deal out of the way, Rockruff apologizes for attacking them, but they don't mind anymore because they finally understand. We then also tell Rockruff that next time we should wait when he jumps into action because we could have avoided this fight altogether if we had just talked it out. He promises to be more careful and so we head back to the guild. Surfetched welcomes us back with a big thank you and as a reward he gives us two reviver seeds. That's when I remember that I used to be in an exploration team myself too with somebody else, but we can't remember if it was with Rockruff or another Pokemon. But I guess we're just going to have to keep on training with Rockruff to find out because Chapter 4, Agent of Maelstrom, is here. One day we were looking at the bulletin board and we see a flyer for the Daylight Festival, an event where the entire town takes a day off to celebrate the day that time was restored and the light returned. You have different contests there, which you can participate in yourself. You have a trivia contest, with the Kecleon brothers, where Togedomaru has already been a five times champ. There's also a scavenger hunt, where you have to find the most hidden Corsola twigs, which was won by Alchemy last year. There's also an apple eating contest, where Rockruff came in second last year, but he got beaten out by Snom, which is actually hilarious if you think about it. And at the end of the festival, there's a guild spar, where all the apprentices have a friendly battle with each other to see who comes out on top. Team Brawl won last year, so we gotta try and beat them this year. Well, 
waiting until the festival arrives, we go into town and check up on the Kecleon brothers. We're having some trouble because the criminals stole a TM from their shop last night. The only thing they know is that it's probably a water type because in the morning they woke up and their color change ability activated and Kecleon woke up as a water type himself. However, the only TM they stole was a TM for Ice Beam, which was a little weird because they had a ton of them laying around. We tell them that we're going to help them out, we don't even need a reward in order to catch this thief, and there's also only two places this water type could have gone, either the Flooded Cavern or the Salty Grotto. We decide to check out the Salty Grotto first, but this time Rockruff has to calm down and not just jump in head first. This dungeon is filled with the different kinds of Pokemon, you have Lil Leap, Wismers for some reason, water types, gold bats, but being in this dungeon for too long makes you incredibly thirsty, so we had to rush through it fast and enter the Salty Grotto Pit. We see a lonely Galisopod talking to himself as he mutters, what matters is I got the TM just like Lord Maelstrom asked. We notice a faint red glow around him, thinking that it's a ability because we've actually never seen something like that before. Then he says, yeah I know, I just feel like we're preparing for something that'll never happen. Are we even sure they would be the one to come back? What if it's someone completely random? I'm thinking by myself, at least he hasn't noticed us yet so we can listen and maybe find out something more but Rockruff rushes in once again in the middle of my thoughts. He looks at me weird and says, this can't be. Then he disregards it and says, no, it must be a coincidence, there's no way it's you. That's too easy. Rockruff says that we're Team Smash and we're going to absolutely smash his face in and get that TM back. But Galisopod is Lord Maelstrom's prized agent and isn't afraid to show us why that is. He might be a water type, which is super effective against the both of us, but we have moves like Bounce and Rock Tomb, which are just too strong for the emergency exiting bug. After the battle, Rockruff mentions my name and Galisopod is immediately in shock. And then he gets incredibly happy, so it's true, you're really Zwick. I have to get back to Lord Maelstrom because he needs to know about this. And he then bids us adieu, but Rockruff wants to go after him, but we yell at him to stop. We tell him that we shouldn't have charged into this battle in the first place because he knew my name and he might have known where I come from and how I get back out of here. We could have gotten some valuable information out of Galisopod if Rockruff didn't jump in once again. But Rockruff thinks listening gets nothing done. And so we say, is that why you don't listen to me? That's when he gets it's incredibly sad because he's heard it a couple of times before from Team Brawl. And so we head back because there's really not much else for us to do here. We go back to the Kekleon shop and inform them that we didn't get their TM back, but we did give the thief a beating. They're happy with that outcome, and we ask them if they've ever heard about a Lord Maelstrom, but they have no idea who they are. So we head back to the base and go to sleep, but we can't help but think about how Galisopod knew me and that he's the only one who seems to remember me. We have to find him again because he might be the key to all of this. But for now, let's catch some sleep and head on to chapter 5, Caught in the Past. But that same evening, I start dreaming again, and the same voice comes in my dream, saying, hey there, Zwiggo, ready to head out? But only this time I recognize the voice as Rockruff's. Apparently, he wants me to go on a job today, so he asks if it's Kecleon's job, but he just says that we're silly and that we can't seem to remember, but that he's ready to go from the moment that we do remember. We wake up the next morning and Rockruff is already giving a message to Surfetched. We don't know what it's about, but Rockruff seems fine once once again after our little squabble yesterday, and with a couple more days going by, we eventually go to sleep again and start dreaming once more. It's once again about Rockruff, and he says, good morning, have you slept well while we're still sleeping? He also says that there must be a Pokemon that brought me here and that we have to look for it so we can find out more about where I come from and maybe if he can send me back. But there is something weird, this doesn't sound like my Rockruff at all. Even though they say that they're my partner, when I say, you're not the Rockruff I know, they don't know what I'm talking about. But then we get woken up by the actual Rockruff in excitement. He says that we've got an appointment with Ninetales, one of the wisest women in the arcane forest. She might know why we're here and how we can get back. That was 
was also the message he relayed to Surfetched a couple of days back. He once again apologizes for jumping into Galisopod and Mudbray because he's still trying to learn how to be patient, so we apologize as well and head over to the Arcane Frosts. A freezing dungeon full of ice types, that's no problem for a fire and a rock type to deal with. Once this cold journey was over, however, we reached the Arcane Frost's heart. We see Ninetales standing there, but the only thing I can think of is that I've already been here and that I have the feeling that we're being watched. We disregard it, however, and go and talk to Ninetales. The first two times, she doesn't seem to hear us, so we shout at her and that wakes her up from her meditation. She then tells us that we can both ask her one question we want the answer to. Rockruff decides on how can I be the very best teammate to my partner Zwigo. Her advice is two Pokemon working together must build a friendship on trust and respect, but above all else, you must communicate. And if we do so clearly and honestly, we will have a successful career together. This sounds like some relationship advice, but I'll take it. But for Rockruff specifically to grow, he must stop looking back. He has to get over his past and move on. Then she says, now you Zwigo, it's nice to finally meet you, though we've spoken before. Because she She's the one who escorted me from the human world to the Pokemon world. She knows I have a burning question, so I ask, how do I get back home to the human world? The only way for me to return home is for me to fulfill my role here. And that role is to save our world. Cause as it turns out, Ninetales got this cryptic message. Beware the dark tomorrow, beware the clouds of red, beware the flood of sorrow from the world that won't be said. Unfortunately, she does not know more than this, but I know that we have returned to save us from this incoming disaster. But Ninetales also says to save the world once more. Rockruff doesn't really understand why she says this, so she elaborates saying that we've already saved the world another time with the assistance of Rockruff, because he's the only one that reached out to Ninetales when I needed a partner. But Rockruff doesn't understand how could he have been my partner if we have never met before and can't remember me at all. But unfortunately for Ninetales, this is a mystery as well. But she knows it's a mystery that we can solve. And while Ninetales might not know what exactly is coming for us, she does know that there is a battle that me and my partner need to overcome. Rockruff then asks Ninetales what we saved the world from the last time, but she can't seem to remember, because she's also not the Ninetales that everybody's heard about. She's the student of her late mentor, and has only started answering people's questions and bringing humans into the Pokemon world recently. So she still has a lot to learn, and beyond this, she can't really help me, because the other Ninetales is the one that guided me on my past adventure. Once she met me, she was also supposed to give me clockwork scarves, which are said to be woven by Celebi, but they're very special items as they were once crafted from the ancient Tree of Life and they're imbued with the power to temporarily accelerate your body's time and make you evolve. Rockruff was supposed to return them here after our last mission, where we saved the world, but unfortunately, he never did. Ninetales seems a bit down because she wasn't able to help us anymore, but Rockruff says that what she's done is already more than enough, because now we know how to get me home. If she gets any information, she will be sure to contact us, and now that we know there's going to be a final battle, we better go and prepare ourselves for it. And that leads us into Chapter 6, The Daylight Festival. One of the nights before the festival, however, we start dreaming. It's Rockruff saying that he never thought he'd be picked for something like this, and that he's been having trouble sleeping these past few nights because he's so anxious. Because it's really scary to go up against something that you know nothing about. But he's doing this to help me fulfill my role as my best friend. Worried or not, he won't leave my side. But then we wake up the next morning and Rockruff is all excited because today is the Daylight Festival. So we go through the entire day and in the end, it's us against Team Brawl remaining. First, we have to do a two-on-two -two against Toxtricity and Scrafty, and once we beat them, we get to face their leader, War Turtle. They're getting cocky, saying that they'll beat us in no time, but that's not what happened at all, as we first take out Scrafty with a couple of double kicks, and then proceed to finish off Toxtricity by spamming Fire Fang. With that amazing victory under our belt, we get to face War Turtle. 
She says that she won't go easy on us, but this is not the Rockruff she remembers at all. He has grown so much and is ready to take on his former leader. Just like the other two goons we just defeated, we just bounce and double kick while Rockruff digs and thunderfangs. And just when we're about to deliver the final blow, it gets dark all of a sudden. And there's red clouds surrounding the area. And in all the commotion, Galisopod shows up and says that the great Lord Maelstrom has ordered the kidnapping of all the townsfolk. And he's here to carry out these orders. However, Team Brawl and Surfage jump in, saying that they messed with the wrong town because there's a lot of strong Pokemon here that they can't kidnap. But as it turns out, Galisopod isn't the only agent here because we hear screams from the other side of town of other people getting kidnapped. Everybody is going to cover a different side to protect the villagers, and we get ordered to go to the Kecleon shop because there is a Gyarados here trying to take them with him. But now that the Kecleon brothers know that this Gyarados works for Lord Maelstrom, they get all riled up because they stole their Ice Beam TM. And every time somebody steals something from the Kecleon brothers, they get their ass whooped. So we jump into this battle with all four of us and destroy this Gyarados in mere seconds. After the battle, he says it doesn't matter because by now, Galisopod and Starmies have already fulfilled their jobs. Rockruff then asks in anger why they're doing all of this and apparently he grants these Pokemon power you could not fathom. And we should be grateful that he's not permitted to use it on us, implying that Lord Maelstrom must know us. That's when Gyarados flees and we check up on the rest of the town members. As it turns out, they could not apprehend the criminals and once everybody got to the beach, Starmie had already inflicted confusion on everyone and was dragging them all into the sea. We hear around town that multiple people have been kidnapped and then a sleepy Wigglytuff stumbles upon us. She had no idea this was all happening and gives Surfetch the perfect apple to try and make it better, but that really doesn't do a lot as everybody is severely injured from the fighting. Everybody in town is incredibly sad and War Turtle and the gang say they're sorry for letting everybody down. Everything's safe for now, so we regroup back at the guild where Surfetch has an announcement to make. He thinks it's reasonable to assume that Lord Maelstrom is keen on destruction and upsetting the balance of our world. Snom thinks that Lord Maelstrom could be Kyogre because he's considered the Lord of the Sea and all of his apprentices were water types. But that's impossible because Kyogre returned to its slumber in a distant region many years ago. Disregarding that, Surfage says that the agents of Lord Maelstrom will surely return but we will be prepared when they do because we're going to train up. That night, me and Rockruff are talking about what happened and what we don't understand is why they even kidnapped these townspeople. Why do they want them? What's the purpose behind it? And Rockruff just says, I don't know, maybe to be evil? Because kidnapping is what villains do? We stop breaking our head over it and go to sleep to enter chapter 7 in the Thunderdome. The next morning, Rockruff is thinking about legendary Pokemon that would want to do this to the world, but he can't think of any other water type legendaries that are capable of bringing such destruction. That's when we get the idea to search for a legendary Pokemon ourselves in order to aid us, and Rockruff seems to know the perfect one, but we just need to ask Surfetched for his permission. And so Rockruff says, do you know where Tapu Koko lives? Surfetched gets this incredibly scared look on his face and asks why, and after explaining that we want to try and get its help, Surfage says that Tapu Koko has no time for antics like this because it doesn't even do his job in the Thunder Tropics, and goes on a long monologue on how he went there when he was still a far-fetched. Just by ending it off with, anyways, Tapu Koko is not worth the effort, now I must be off, I have a lot to sort out today. We disregard his advice, however, and decide to go and ask him anyway. But when we're talking about this, I see somebody watching us from the window, and we run over, but there's nobody there. And Rockruff also says that we're inside of a cliff face, so no one could actually be there because it's just a drop down to the sea. But there is no more time to waste, we have to head to the Thunder Tropics to speak with Tapu Koko. A harsh environment full of electric types, but luckily we as chosen heroes work as an insulator against their electricity, and with our jolt of power, we make our way to the Thunder Tropics heart. But there seems to be nothing here but a dead end, but I can feel the static in the air. And that's when Tapu Koko comes out and says, who dares awaken me from my slumber? We try to reason with it by saying that we need him to save the world, but he doesn't care because the one that awakens him from his slumber needs to feel his wrath. So even though we didn't come here to fight, that's what we're going to do, baby. And quite literally, the only thing we had to do was just click Firefang four times in a row while Rockruff was using Dig, and 
And just like that, the bird, or whatever Tabu Koko is, is defeated. But it doesn't seem like we defeated him at all, as he says, I will now show you the power of my... <laughs> He can't keep this charade up anymore. The voice that he was talking in was all just a ruse. And he's not here to strike us down at all. He only did it because he becomes bored so easily on this island. So he just wanted to have some fun. Rockruff does get pretty mad at him, but he just tells him to eat an orange berry and we'll be fine. I guess he does have a point there, so we go on and tell him what we need from him. But he just says, sounds like effort. Which is something he doesn't like doing. And on top of that, the task of protecting everybody has fallen on much tinier shoulders, namely mine. Meaning that he knows about us because he's been around for many years and he can recognize a human when he sees one. As it turns out, he's also seen us when we saved the world for the first time, but he can't seem to remember any other details. The only thing we need to know is that when a human is supposed to save the world, it always goes their way. Whenever a human shows up, Tapu Koko doesn't interfere because he knows we're going to succeed. However, the last time he saw us, he does remember that one of us was crying uncontrollably and that's why we didn't fight. A strange detail to include because none of us are really crybabies. He also says that everything is going to plan out as expected and that we should stop meddling. However, Rockruff says that he's selfish because he is still a legendary Pokemon and his duty is still to keep this region safe. But Tapu Koko says that if he would step in, then he would become selfish because imagine if he got involved in every conflict, big and small, then Pokemon would stop relying on each other and instead would only be relying on him. And if he would ever fall, they would be defenseless. So that's why he's staying out of all of it so that all the Pokemon remain strong in this region. He says that we will succeed no matter how hard the road may be and that we should go back to our regular lives for now. Just when we leave, Tapu Koko turns around and says, Wait, last time you were here, Zwigo, you were with us. And then his sentence cuts off because we're already gone, which might mean our previous partner wasn't a Rockruff at all. That evening in bed, me and Rockruff reminisce about the day, and while unfortunately we didn't really gain anything from this adventure, I myself do get the feeling that something isn't right. I should have saved the world, I should not be here again. If the world was in danger again, there should be another human sent here. This all doesn't make any sense. I really didn't want to come back because I was super happy as a human, and it doesn't matter how badly I want to go back to being human, it can't happen until I save this world. And that leads us into chapter 8, Homesickness. As the days fly by, I get more and more homesick and depressed. Rockruff does notice this, but he doesn't really say anything about it, until one night where he finally asks if I'm okay. I answer with no, and as a gesture to try and cheer me up, he comes and lays beside me and says, Feeling alone is one of the worst feelings in the world. He used to feel alone too when he was still in the dungeon. But that's nothing compared to me because I probably have a home and friends that I'm missing. But he just wants me to know that I'm never alone here. Because as my partner, he'll always be by my side. He also mentions that it doesn't matter that we don't remember our old friendship because even if I were a total stranger, he still thinks we would have become friends. And right now, I'm his best friend in the whole wide world. And he'll stay by my side until I finally get back home. We thank him for these heartwarming words and finally cheer up again. And tomorrow he's going to take us to a very special place. The next morning we wake up and apparently our morning's been fantastic so far because we went to a cafe together, drank some hot drinks and talked about his fun times at Team Brawl. But now it's time for our mini adventure because we're going to be heading over to the Emerald Hill. So we roll out and apparently this is a very short dungeon so we just destroy everything in in our path, and then when we get to the Emerald Hill Crest, Rockruff tells me to close my eyes as he leads me to this beautiful open space that looks down on the entire valley. We can't believe our own eyes as we see the wind sweeping the fields and the water glistening. It really looks like something out of a fantasy. This is Rockruff's favorite place. He always begged War Turtle to take him here when they were still training together. Or should he say take him back because he is from the Emerald Hill Dungeon. I guess you could say 
say this was once his home. And he's incredibly glad that he can take us here himself now, to share this beautiful view with us. He points at a sea very far away from here and tells me a story about a legend of the wishing star. Because some time ago, a comet fell from the sky and it landed in the sea just beyond the peak of the furthest mountain, and it formed the entrance to a mystery dungeon. The entrance is hidden deep under the waves, but if you manage to find it, it will take you into a massive 100 floor dungeon. And at the bottom of that dungeon is the item that fell from the sky that day, a wishing star. They say it's a piece of an ancient and powerful monster and will grant the greatest wish if you find it. But with a wishing star, there's a big prize for your wish. They say it costs you your mind, even the kindest Pokemon could be driven to madness if they used it. And Rockruff can't imagine wanting a wish to come true that badly to risk something like that. Rockruff then asks me if I have a story about the human world to tell him as well, and I say that I have a family, but I don't have a lot of friends because we used to move around all the time for my parents' work. It's incredibly sad to not keep your friends, but sadly enough I got used to it. But just before I was sent back to the Pokemon world, I was actually about to transfer schools, which was really exciting. Rockruff knows that once we get back to the human world, I will make a ton of friends because who wouldn't want to be friends with me? And on top of this, he's also incredibly happy that this trip cheered me up. But I don't want to leave yet because I know that I've been here the last time I was in the Pokemon world. So we stay a little longer to enjoy the view and head into chapter 9, Gut of the Geist. The next morning we get a job request from Surfetched that is specifically made for us. While it's pretty cool that we're making a name of ourselves, this could also be a trap, so we have to watch out. But if this really is from Lord Maelstrom, we do have to try and take him down, so we decide to go ahead with the mission anyway. We head over to the beach where we were called, but I once again get the feeling that we're being watched. Unfortunately, Rockruff sniffs around and he can't seem to find anybody. And then we get called over by a Palosand who was the one that delivered this job request. He will pay us like legendaries if we managed to complete this job. But first he needs to tell something about himself. Palosand are very misunderstood Pokemon, because as it turns out, inside of his castle walls, many get lost. Children are told bedtime stories about unruly youths who went in and never came out. But he assures us that that has never happened before, at least not intentionally. Incidents have occurred when he slept, but these are very rare. He may not be able to speak for others of his kind, but he does not intend to eat people because in the end they always find their way out of his dungeon. And furthermore, Pokemon that do eventually escape leave their sorrows behind, because he has the ability to absorb negative energy. But recently he has had somebody inside him that just doesn't want to leave. They like it in there way too much, and this makes him very uncomfortable, so he hired us to go inside of him and clear it out. And as our reward, he will absorb all of our sorrows to make us way happier. Seems like a pretty good exchange if you think about it, but do we really have to believe him on his word? I guess we can only find out by entering him, so let's get through Palisand's Palace. But upon entering, we see that this is really an actual dungeon, and somehow I myself can remember already being in here. How is that even possible? And while going through the dungeon, it seems like the Pokemon that's occupying this place isn't the only one because we battle different Shuckles and all other kinds of beings here. So we did our best to clean all of those out as well until we reached the depths of the palace. The only thing we see here is a tiny Sinistee, and so we ask if this is the intruder that's giving Palosan such a bellyache. But the only thing Sinistee says is, not me, us. And that's when five other Sinistees surround us, as they don't don't want to leave this place and attack us all together in that moment. They might have the numbers on us, but we have the power of Reviver Seeds bringing us back every time we die. Unfortunately, we also don't have a multi-damaging move, so we're stuck using Fire Fangs most of the time. While their Nightshades hit pretty hard, me and my buddy Rockruff still overcame this obstacle and destroyed the T-Set. The Sinistees are a bit chip, but they seem to be okay, so we apologize for fighting, but also say that they can't stay in here. Their answer to this is that outside it's very lonely and nobody likes them because they're not tasty enough and inside here all their bad feelings are being drunk up. We ask if they're family but it seems like they all came here alone on their own accord. 
and that's when we find a solution. Out there they were alone, and in here they're all together, but what if they just go outside of this place altogether so that they can always be with each other and never have that feeling of loneliness again? They hadn't even thought of this before and agreed to go outside. And just like that, Palo Sand also feels better. And because he sapped all of the bad feelings out of us as well, we really do feel awesome too. We're also incredibly happy with Rockruff because back in the dungeon he was not jumping into the fight immediately and tried to talk, and after the battle was over he even helped the Sinisty solve their problem. I guess it's just really nice to see our best buddy grow like this. But we're both starving so we head back to the guild together and start chapter 10, The Creature. That night we both ended up sleeping amazing, but in the morning just when we're about to head out, I get a sharp pain in my head. It's like something is trying to push its way into my thoughts, and that's when it happens. We hear Ninetales' voice, and she seems to be communicating with us telepathically. She apologizes for her rude entry, but she just had a visit from a distraught alchemy regarding recent events in Treasure Town. She asked if her sister was fine, fortunately for us she is, but she does ask us to elaborate on what happened in the Treasure Town a couple of weeks back. We explain the entire story about Lord Maelstrom, and then she understands. She thinks it's not surprising that this threat is connected to whatever threat we initially faced. She thinks that somebody might be seeking revenge, so we definitely have to watch out even more. We then also ask Ninetales if she's been sending us weird dreams, but she doesn't know anything about these at all, at least not intentionally. She thinks this could be the work of a Psychic-type Pokemon, because they work in dreams a lot. But regardless of that, we have to pay very close attention to them, because they might hold important clues. We then say goodbye to Ninetales and go back to our daily activities until Lord Maelstrom strikes again. That night, however, we have another dream, but it feels incredibly tense as it smells like burning leaves and salt water and the air feels staticky too. Then Rockruff shows up and says that we're here at the summit. Then we see some kind of flashback, as we're on the top of a mountain together with Rockruff, who says that this is where they plan on destroying everything. We walk a little bit further and see a creature that can't be a Pokemon at all. It says that it doesn't know what he is, and he might never know, but he doesn't need to know anymore. As it sees Rockruff trembling, it asks, what is it? Do I repulse you? Rockruff says no, but then, hmm. You see, you're on the brink of tears. I terrify you as I do everyone else in this wretched world. And Rockruff then says, no. No, I won't cry, not this time, because my partner is here with me. Which is a choice we will regret, because he's been given power that only those of legends have a power to destroy. He says that he will fulfill his mission of destruction and will purge everything in this strange world until nothing is left. Rockruff then says we have to stop them, we have to defeat them, and make sure they're sent to the peak of Mount Alcazar. The being says, so be it. I'll make you feel it all, you will feel my agony, my confusion confusion, my rage. You will feel all the pain I felt on that hateful day I received life. So me and Rockruff fight it together, as we keep bouncing and digging until this creature is eventually defeated. And that's when the flashback ends, and we're back in our regular dream world. But we hear Rockruff say one more thing, he says, you can't just go away forever, right? I can't go back to the guild on my own, Toxtricity and Scrafty, they'll- Please don't leave me! But then the actual regular Rockruff wakes us up, as he says we were having a nightmare because we're drenched in sweat. We woke him up by trashing around so much, and even try to use an attack on him. So we explain everything to him, and we think that the Pokemon we fought here might have been Lord Maelstrom, and they were a Pokemon we didn't recognize. I say that we won the battle last time, and that we sent him to a place called Mount Alcazar. As it turns out, this place is a super hostile dungeon in the Far East, and if you had to put the worst criminal somewhere, that'd be the place. So our next move was going around town, asking all of the townspeople and Officer Magnazone about this weird creature that was banned to that peak. Unfortunately, nobody knew what we were talking about. But then we tell Rockruff that nobody remembers me either. Even he himself can't remember me, which might mean that that creature is on that top anyway. The only way to know for sure is if we check. So we make up our minds and decide to go to Mount Alcazar anyway. I mean, we've been slurped up by a sandcastle, I think we can handle this too. So after a long trip, we arrive there and I can feel that I've not been in this place before. So that 
gives us even more reason to explore it. The place is filmed to the brim with steel type Pokemon, but honestly, because we're a fire type, these are pretty easily to deal with. So as it turns out, this incredibly hard dungeon is nothing for a veteran Pokemon like myself. And so we hiked up our way to the peak of Mount Alcazar. Warcraft bursts out in happiness, but we see the Pokemon we've been searching for standing there in front of us. He asks us why we've come here, and tells us to leave because he doesn't want any visitors. Warcraft says that we will fight him again if we must, and that's when he asks, again? What do you mean again? We ask him if he's Lord Maelstrom, but he says he has never heard of this title before, as his name is Sil Valley. In return, he asks our names as well, and we he sees Wigo and Rockruff. He remembers the name Zwigo very well. Me and my partner are the ones that battled him during his rampage, and managed to save the world from his wrath. But he recalls that we were much larger when we fought, and so we explain that we were evolved by using special scars, and we also ask if he really hasn't left this peak since we fought. To which he says, no, I've been here since that fight, it's left me to think, I've wondered about the fate of you two all this time. We explain everything to Sil Valley after this, because he he seems pretty interested about my life. And so in the end, we just want to know if he wants revenge on us. Luckily, he doesn't, and destruction also hasn't appealed to him since the day we fought him. Ever since that moment, he's been filled with hope and envy for me, so we ask him why. And as it turns out, we're both from the human world. Only he was created there, and I am actually a human. But there is one thing that Sylvalli remembers very much, and it's something that Rockruff said. But even Rockruff doesn't seem to remember what it was. When the battle ended, Sil Valley had been beaten up, but he was not ready to give up. If he could not destroy the world, he would at least destroy me. And that's when Rockruff threw himself in front of Sil Valley's final effort to destroy me, risking his life to save mine. And then he told Sil Valley how much he cared about me, how much he valued our friendship, and how it saved him from a lifetime of hurt. When we were by each other's sides, we could do anything. And on top of that, that he would do anything for me, his partner. Never had Sylvali seen a Pokemon care for someone so deeply, and having never had a companion of his own, he was in awe of it. He might have been created for destruction, but in that moment, he understood what love was. From that moment on, he changed his ways, and went to this peak for his crimes, and never saw either of us again. We thank Sylvali for sharing this story, and ask if he really doesn't know anything about Lord Maelstrom, but he really does does not know, unfortunately. So Rockruff says, Sil Valley, I'm sorry, but Sil Valley tells him that he has nothing to worry about, he did nothing wrong, but Rockruff then says, I'm sorry that you've never known happiness before. That kind of shocks Sil Valley, and then Rockruff asks, when you were destroying everything, did that make you happy? To which he responds, I guess not. See, so that means that isn't how you can find happiness, but there are other things you can do, like making friends, eat really tasty food, and helping others. But Sil Valley just scrunts and says, I appreciate your speech, Rockruff. There is much passion behind it. But when I spoke to you last time, you did not sound this way. Your words were just as powerful, but your tone was much meeker. Rockruff has heard this before from me when I dream about him, but unfortunately he can't remember any of it. But Sil Valley knows that we can fulfill our purpose here. But unfortunately he can never fulfill his because he's not in the world he was created in anymore, as he feels like there's no place he belongs now. So Rockruff asks, in this moment of hardship, do you want to join Team Smash, Sylvali? Sylvali says, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can say yes, though I'd like to. He's afraid that he's not going to be too great at teamwork, because the only thing he's ever known is destruction. But Rockruff says that it's alright, because he was just like that until he met me. So Rockruff proposes something. He says that Sylvali can stay up here as long as he wants, but he can come on jobs with us to get some experience. Sylvali finally accepts our proposal, which means Team Smash has just been upgraded. We give him his badge so that he can always teleport to us, and even though this trip went very different than we expected, we got a new team member. And as his parting words, Sylvali says, thank you, I think I might be beginning to understand what joy really is. And this brings us to chapter 11, Lord Maelstrom's Lament. And the next morning we wake up with the feeling that 
that we can change anybody's heart if we manage to do it with Sil Valley. Who knows, maybe even Lord Maelstrom's. We go back to our usual routine of doing jobs, only this time with Sil Valley, but then one day, Ninetales calls us up again with telepathy. Or at least, that's what we think, but we quickly realize that it's not Ninetales at all, it's another voice. Seeing that it doesn't matter who he is, but if we want to save our stupid little town, we have to come down to the beach at dusk. And we can't bring anybody else, just me and Rockruff. And they'll be waiting for us as we try to save the world. They leave my headspace and we tell Rockruff everything. But we've been preparing for this moment, so we're ready. It's showtime. Let's confront Lord Maelstrom once and for all and end this off. We arrive at the beach at the right time and call out for Lord Maelstrom, but the only thing that shows up is a Starmie who says that it's an agent of Lord Maelstrom. Rockruff shouts out, not for long because we're here to take you down. That's when we all of a sudden get a big headache as Starmie starts emitting these weird radio waves into our brain. As it turns out, they've acquired the power to Dynamax and this has given Starmie the ability to wipe Pokemon's memories. But not completely, it's no Uxie, but it can erase a few key specifics for a very large swath of Pokemon. It would love to use this power to crush us where we stand, but the Lord has requested to offer us a fair fight, so on guard. Just like all of the other bosses, Starmie did not stand a chance against us. It might have been able to heal up a couple of times with recover, but our damage racked up in the end, and we came out victorious. But it doesn't matter because their plan worked. We were so occupied battling Starmie that we couldn't hear the destruction nearby. So we rush into town and see that War Turtle has just lost a battle against Golisopod, all because he had the power of Dynamax. And just when he's about to deliver the final blow against War Turtle, we jump in, and this scares him off. We check up on War Turtle and he says that Toxtricity and Scrafty got flung into the sea by this Galisopod while it was in Dynamax form and that they would be collected by Lord Maelstrom and won't be harmed. We hear some more ruckus into the town so we check it out and we see that some of the guild members have taken down Gyarados. Luckily Guildmaster Wigglytuff was able to get most of the townspeople back into the guild where they would be safe. While the battle was going on some of the town was destroyed but luckily nobody was injured. They bring Gyarados to Officer Magnus his own so that he can atone for his sins and then we go back to the guild. As Surfage calls a meeting because he has some very important information about the people that have been kidnapped. As it turns out, the Gyarados we managed to capture was holding a wishing piece. The same kind of wishing piece that Rockruff is talking about that makes you lose your mind in exchange for a wish. So it was no legend, it's very real and we are currently facing enemies who are corrupted by its power. This grants him the power to grow to a gargantuan size with stronger moves and none of the mental restraint to contain themselves. So we definitely won't be able to reason with them. It's actually a miracle that we're still alive. And Gyarados, who's now in captivity, shared that if Lord Maelstrom has his way, the whole world will be in danger of a Dynamax rampage, not just Treasure Town. So we have to stop him and his agents now before it gets any worse. Then lastly, Starmie, his third and final agent, has been emitting radio waves that have erased a small part of all of our memories, and his motive apparently appears to have something to do with those missing memories. Luckily, they've conjured up a plan to try and take down Lord Maelstrom and his agents. He, Wigglytuff and War Turtle will be facing Golisopod when he returns. The rest of the guild is going to stay here and protect all of the townspeople and share our food and drink with them to make sure nobody else gets kidnapped. And as for us, Team Smash, from what Gerardo shared, Lord Maelstrom has a particular interest in us. And so, we have to go to the flooded cavern where he apparently resides deep deep within. And with everybody's jobs being clear, it's time to start the mission, save the present. Everybody heads out except for War Turtle, who comes up to us and apologizes to Rockruff for being so harsh on him. But Rockruff understands because he still had a lot to learn back then. War Turtle never told this to Rockruff, but when she was still a Squirtle, nobody wanted her on the team because she was just too weak. So she trained up and even evolved into a War Turtle and decided to join the guild. And that's when she met Toxtricity and Scrap who were just bullies back then. They even picked on her, but she managed to defeat both of them in a two-on-one battle, and that's when they joined up and created the team together. But only on the condition that they would stop bullying others and learn how to help our community instead of hurting it. She tells us all of this just to say that she understands how Rockruff must have felt when he got kicked off the team. And she apologizes 
for being such a lousy leader, but Rockruff says that he's one of the best leaders he's ever seen. He earned his respect when he first saw her in the dungeon, and she made her entire team change their ways just for her. This makes War Turtle incredibly happy, and we say our final goodbyes to her, as she wishes us luck for the final battle. Which means this is it, it's time for us to fulfill our role and save the world. And we know we can overcome it, because we have each other. So we head to the flooded cavern together, and when I say Zwigo is here, the cavern starts lighting up like an invitation, and so we have nothing left to do but go inside. Most of the cave was filled with Lord Maelstrom's agents, so we kicked all of them in the face, and eventually made our way to the deepest parts. But there seems to be no one there until eventually a voice says, Zwigo, you're finally here. And Rockruff, you're here too? You made it through the dungeon? This is obviously Lord Maelstrom, and he's been invisible this entire time, following us around on our entire journey without us being able to see him. Rockruff makes a snarky comment about this not being an ambush anymore because he just told us, and then Lord Maelstrom says, Shut up! This is all because of you, Rockruff. Everything would have been perfect if you didn't get involved. He says that Rockruff can leave right now and there will be no consequences, but if he stays, he will turn him into a puddle right where he stands. Rockruff, being the brave partner that he is, wants to stay around, but the only thing I can think of is that this voice sounds really familiar to me. We tried fighting him, but we couldn't get a single hit in because he's invisible, and so Rockruff eventually falls down exhausted. The Lord says that he might as well give up, but Rockruff doesn't want to. He says that he's not just any common Rockruff. No, he's He's my partner, and because I believe in him, he'll keep going until the end. Once the Lord hears this, he goes absolutely crazy. Rockruff screams out, I would do anything for Zwigo, and then he uncovers himself and says, I would too. And we see that it's actually a shiny Inteleon. And then he knocks Rockruff out with a single snipe shot. Now it's just the two of us, and I guess he's ready to confront me. He says that Rockruff has a lot of nerve to think that he could replace him. But we shouted him to bring Rockruff back, but Inteleon just answers that he's okay, he just fainted and is imprisoned with the rest of the townspeople. He says that it was clever of me to play along up until this point, and it really threw him off, but I have no idea what he's talking about. And so we ask who he really is, because we can't seem to remember at all. He's quite shocked that we don't recognize him, and then he shows who he really is by taking off the evolution scar from Celebi, he turns into a tiny little Sobble. Remember when we gave our partner a name at the beginning? Well, this Pokemon has the same name, but even after all of this, I still can't seem to remember. He tries to come in for a hug, but we scooch back and he says, you still look confused. What's wrong, Zwigo? Aren't you happy to see me? We were once best friends. All our adventures, our days training at the guild. Didn't they mean something to you? He wiped everybody's memories with Starmie's ability and tried to bring my memories back while I was sleeping, hence why I was having all of those weird dreams, but instead of Sobble, inside of those dreams, it was Rockruff. So we say that Rockruff is our real partner and not him, but he says that Rockruff is just a random dungeon Pokemon and that he was my real partner when we were first in the Pokemon world. He was the one that I gave a special nickname to, the one who stuck with me until the very end, but I still can't remember. That's when he gets mad and orders Starmie to end the memory wipe once and for all. As all of my memories pour back into my brain, I get all the flashbacks. For example, when we first woke up on the beach, it was Saul that found me there, and he's the first one that knew that I was actually human. He's the one that took me into Treasure Town, but once we arrived there, we got ambushed by Scrafty and Toxtricity, who were in fact like War Turtle said, nothing but bullies. They're calling Sobble Misprint because of his weird colors and steal all of his items that he found, just so that he can maybe join their rescue team. But they go as far as calling him a freak and that nobody would ever talk to him, so I can see why Sobble is really always sad. They leave and he tells himself not to cry, and we feel incredibly sad for him too, and so we tell him that these guys are not his real friends and that he should stop doing stuff for them. But he has to, because nobody else really wants to be around him. That's when we decide to become friends, and I give him the nickname Santa. This makes him extremely happy, and we even muster up the courage together to join the guild as a rescue team. Once we got in our room together, we got the room of heroes, just like this time with Rockruff. We had so many great times at the guild together, eating from Raibombi's insanely good meals, and telling Sobble that humans in the real world love Pokemon like him, because he has a different color. They even spend hours 
upon hours looking for kinds like him. We went on so many adventures together, getting chased by Pokemon, finding treasure and helping out others. We even confronted Scrafty and Toxtricity and talked to the Ninetales before the one that we know now. We even faced Tapu Koko but didn't battle him because Sobble was crying too much. And the bullies also threw Sobble into Palo Sand and we had to go after him to save him. And just like Rockruff told me about his favorite spot, Sobble also showed me the way there and told me about the legend of the wishing star. And he even says that all of his wishes have already come true because now he's strong and he has a best friend by his side. But then eventually after saving the world from Sil Valley, it was time for me to go back to the human world and Sobble didn't handle this very well, saying that he doesn't want to go back to his life to living without me. He doesn't want to go back to the guild to get bullied by Scrafty and Toxtricity anymore. He wants me to be around forever. He wants me to take him back to the human world, but unfortunately that's not possible. We know he's strong now, so we say, but listen. Even without me, you have to. But unfortunately, we couldn't finish our sentence and Sobble was left crying alone. He missed me so much and all he wanted was for me to come back and then he remembered the wishing star. And this leads us into the final chapter. I won't say goodbye. After I vanished, he went through the grueling 104 dungeon by himself to find the wishing star. He fainted so many times, burning through reviver seat after reviver seat and could barely stand by the end of it. But I was worth it for him. And when he finally reached the wishing star, he wished for some way to see me again, no matter what it took. And as he felt the surge of red power run through him, he remembered something that Ninetales said, that I was only here to fulfill my purpose of saving the world. So Sobble knew that the only way to bring me back was to put the world in danger once again. So far his plan worked perfectly, he became the villain and I was the brave hero. But I don't actually have to do that, because he has a wishing star fragment for me to help me understand. Because once his agents touched it, they understood why he was doing all of this, and it will give you the power to Gigantamax, the power to destroy the world. And then I realized that his mind is corrupted by the wishing star, because I know that the Sobble I knew would never do this at such a cost. We try to snap him out of this by asking why do you want me to do this? Because this is how we can always stay together. We won't have to be heroes anymore, we can be a villain together with him. And since we're threatening the world, we won't ever have to leave. And if another human is called to stop us with their partner, they'll see the gift we're giving them. The gift of never saying goodbye. And if they don't understand, we'll beat them down. So he asks me to join him. But in that moment, I get an idea. If I take this wishing star fragment, I might be able to make Sobble faint and then destroy the wishing star fragment after so that he comes back to his senses. So I pick it up and I get really dizzy and incredibly angry thinking, why does this world need me to become a Pokemon to save it? I don't even want to be here at all. But then I realize that I'm actually a human and it can't really control my mind. It only affects my body. So I I'm able to shrug off the corruption. Sobble thinks that we have joined his side, so he gives me my clockwork scarf so I can evolve. And he welcomes me back to Team Smash. But in that moment, I say, no, I'm going to save this world and I'm going to go home. Because even if I didn't want to go home, even if I wanted to stay so I joined you, other Pokemon would suffer because of it and I could never do that. So I'm gonna use this scarf and this power you gave me to stop you once and for all. But Subble still doesn't snap out of it and says that if this is how I want it to be, in order to keep me here, he'll have to battle me. We both evolve into Cinderace and Inteleon and then the fight begins. It was a hard-fought battle, but with all of the Yorin Berries and Reviver Seed I've picked up on my journey, our strength was matched and we were both forced to turn into our Gigantamax forms and fight it out that way. In the end we lost and Santa was even able to take my scarf away, de-evolving me back into Score Bunny. Inteleon realizes that he had a bit of an upper hand because he has the type advantage against me. But it's not over, because he knows we still want to fight and we can do that. We'll fight again and again and again again, forever. So we scream, that's enough! Because he's been trying to make me understand his side, it's now time for him to try and understand mine. I know that we were best friends and we cared for each other so much and our bond even saved the world. We really were true partners. And I know how scared he must have felt when I had to leave and how sad he must have felt when that bond was broken. But the truth is that he hasn't been seeing me right all this time. 
The truth is that I'm not a perfect being. I get scared and sad all the time. And right now, I'm the saddest I've ever been because not only is a world I care about in danger, but I just had to fight my best friend. I had to hurt someone really important to me. And more than anything, Sobel, I just really want to go home. That's when he finally understand and breaks the wishing piece and apologizes for everything he's done. And after shattering the piece, he turns back into his regular form but can't seem to remember what just happened as it all feels like a weird dream. That's when Rockruff spurts out of the blue and says, Wiggo, you did it! You got everybody out! All the Pokemon that were kidnapped are free again! I'm still crying uncontrollably and Rockruff tries to calm me down by saying everything is okay, we did incredible. I fall down to the ground and start crying even more and he says, I'm here, stay close to me and cry all you need. And that's when Sobel realizes that's what true friendship looks like. After my emotions were poured out, I felt better and we could go back to our regular talking, and Rockruff even apologizes for not being by my side for all of this. He's also pretty sad to learn that he wasn't my original partner after all, but he's still happy that Ninetales made that mistake so that we were able to meet. He's incredibly glad he got to be my partner, and I feel the same way about him. Now that Sobel is free from the corruption, Rockruff goes over to try and meet him properly. He apologizes over and over again, saying that he really didn't want to hurt anyone. He was just constricted by the feelings of sadness and the particles of the wishing star. And seeing me cry really felt awful to him, even more awful than when I actually left the first time. For the first time he had a wish that was deeper than seeing me again, and that was to stop my crying. And in that moment he realized he had to smash that wishing star. And now he understands how badly I want to go back to the human world, because I don't really belong here. He also says sorry to Rockruff about all the things he said as Lord Maelstrom and thanks him for taking such care of me, saying that he's a real, true friend. And so we try to go home together, because the world was saved once again. And while we're in town, Team Brawl comes up to us and apologizes to Sobel for bullying him for all those years. They realized they were wrong for treating Sobel different because he had a weird color. And so Sobel thanks them for their apology and forgives them as well. But Warturtle knows that we're going to be turning back into a human soon, which means we will leave this world. So they ask Rockruff to join their team again. He kindly declines the offer however because from now on Team Smash will live on as Sobble and Rockruff. From that moment on, Team Smash and Team Brawl are rivals, but they're also the bestest of friends. We head back to the beach and Rockruff and Sobble talk a bit about how they're going to manage Team Smash from now on, but then Ninetales comes along with her telepathy and says that it's time for me to go back. In a few moments, the light will envelop me, so we have to say everything we need to now. My body starts glowing, and while Rockruff is really shocked, Sobble looks incredibly sad again. We tell him that we're sorry about all of this and that we couldn't really catch up since last time, but despite everything that happened, Sobble is still so dear to me. We will never forget what Sobble did for me on my first adventure, even saving my life during the Sil Valley fight. We really are going to miss him, and we are sorry that he has to go through all of this again, but Sobble now realizes that this is for the best, and that we shouldn't worry about him, because he's found a new purpose. If another human is called here to save the world with their new partner, he's going to be here for both of them, and that is just a wonderful idea. He's really going to miss me and because he met me he knows what a true friend really is. He knows exactly what to look for in another Pokemon's qualities now but luckily he doesn't have to look far because his new team member Rockruff is right there. Speaking of Rockruff, it's time to say goodbye to him as well. We thank him for being my best friend and for training with me, for fighting by my side and for comforting me when I felt sad. He tried so hard to get me back home and I bet I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. And so Rockruff says that I mean the entire world to him and that he would do all of this over again if it meant helping me get back home. We say our final goodbyes and thank these two for being the best partners they could have been and drift off into the sunset. Rockruff and Sobel stay behind on the beach and say that they'll miss me a whole lot. And he shouts out one last thing. Hey Zwiggo, can you hear me? We're gonna be amazing, so you'd better show the human world how amazing you are too. Right, Sobel? And then Sobel also screams, show them what an amazing person you are. You better give it your all out there, because Team Smash is gonna become the best exploration team of all time. With their last words being, Zwiggo, thank you for everything. Because of you, we will shine as Pokemon for the rest of our lives. 
We don't know how time moves here compared to where you're going, but if we could have one wish, a pure wish from Arceus, we both agreed what we would ask for. Someday across time and space, let's be friends again.